Hey everybody, welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I'm your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father. And with my lovely co-host... Crystal. We have an awesome interview lined out for you guys and gals out there today. We have formerly a Poison and current guitarist of the Winery Dogs, Mr. Richie Coxon. I have been a huge fan of this guy for a very long time. I've even said that he's an underrated guitarist. You know, he is. He's getting his dues, folks. Trust me. He's an awesome guitarist. Uh, he's with the Winery Dogs right now. And we're going to be talking about... His 20, let's see, what is this? His 21st solo album. And that's that's crazy to even think that. But it's Salting Earth, which will be released April the 14th on his own record label called Headroom Incorporated. So, Richie, my man, how's it going? I'm doing well, very well. Uh, thanks for calling me. Very excited about the new record, which uh, is coming out on April 14th. It will be released. And we're starting our world tour. April 21st, our first show will be in Agora Hills, the Canyon Club. And from there, we're going to go across the United States. We'll be out probably for a good five weeks touring the United States and then uh, head to South America, come back up to Mexico and head over to Australia, Japan, Europe. We've got a lot planned, so I'm very excited to get busy. You know, I'm going to jump right into this. I've had a conversation before with Eddie Trunk. He's been on my show. Of course, we all know him from that metal show. Plus, he does uh, some radio work as well. He's well known. Of course, you all know who Eddie Trunk is. If you don't, then you're, you're living under a rock somewhere. <laughs> but anyway, he stated that you were one of the most underrated guitarists. Do you still feel that that way right now, man? That that statement to be true? Because, you know, you've got 21 solo albums that's out right now, man. But I feel like you're getting your due right now for being in the winery dogs. Well, you know, I never thought I was underrated. I don't know really where that, that came from. I think when someone is claimed to be underrated, it means they're they're better than what people say they are. And, and the reality is, as far as the term of being an underrated guitar player seems insane to me because I was actually on the cover of Guitar World magazine when I was 19. And I was right. uh, in the reader's poll as a back then as well so to say that i'm underrated as a guitar player doesn't really make sense i think maybe to say i was under uh, i was not well known as a, as a recording artist that that would make but i don't really understand what that means when they say underrated i think i'm pretty rated at, uh, at you know the way i should be rated I'm everybody that knows my name knows that i'm a guitar player so right. it all kind of makes sense to me but, you know it's interesting when you're uh, when you're outside of outside you know when you're inside looking out, you know, you don't know how you're perceived. So I'm sure that's probably meant as some kind of a compliment, you know, and if it is, I will take it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's what we were talking about. It was no disrespect or anything like that. It was just totally, because I, I, I loved your guitar playing, and I was talking to him about it. I was like, you know, I think he's one of the most underrated guitarists, and I think he's, you know, he deserves his due. Well, thank you. And, you know, I think what really comes down to, you know, I've, I've really always kind of been, uh, I guess you could say under the radar a little bit, you know, yeah. um, and and I think that's kind of what that, when people use that phrase, is kind of what they're talking about. You know, I've never been uh, a mainstream artist, you know, I, it's not something I really spent a lot of time thinking about at this stage of the game. I think I'm fortunate that I can make music that I love and uh, get out in front of people that are interested in in, in hearing me play and sing. And the reality is uh, overrated, underrated, whatever you want to call it. You know, I, I've never done anything other than, than write music and perform it. And that's how I've survived my entire life since I was a teenager. So I'm really thankful. I'm really happy about where I am at this stage. And it actually feels like things are, are actually growing, you know. And, and, you know, every time I put out a record, it seems like we play, you know, longer tours and, and, and see more people on the road and, and more people seem to be talking about the music. So it, it's great. I have no complaints. What was your experience like while recording Salting Earth? Well, you know, I have kind of an unorthodox way of, of making records, at least when I think about how, you know, other people talk about making records. But, you know, I had a situation, now I, I just moved now. Eventually I'll have the same situation. But before I moved, I lived in the same house for 20 years, and I had a recording studio in the house. And what I did, the way I, I set it up, was I would have everything mic'd up and ready to go, meaning the drum set, the bass amp, the guitar amps, my vocal signal chain, with my microphone, everything would be wired so that at any point, at any time, I can go to any instrument, including the, the keyboards, the organ, and record something. And so what that did is it afforded me a luxury 
to be able to record ideas the minute I got them, I mean, provided I was home. So this record was recorded that way so that I, I had time where I could have an idea, record part of the song, live with it for a while, and then do something else, and then come back to it maybe a month later and, and work on it some more. And with that kind of flexibility, I think it really helps with how the, the music comes to life. And, and being that I'm one person, it's kind of the only way I can really work is if I, I have it set up like that. So, you know, I know a lot of people when they make records, they'll, they'll say, okay, we've got 10 songs, now let's book the studio and go record it, which, you know, that can work too. But I just kind of do things more, a little differently. And, and just because, like I said, I'm just one person. So I have the luxury to kind of to do it at my leisure, so to speak. You recorded this album yourself, correct, Richie? Yeah, many of my records. Yeah, most of them actually. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like this side, man, to, to have that freedom to do, you know, when you want to and do it your way? Do you do you like yeah. this side? Yeah, of course, yeah. But, I mean, if I didn't like it, I, would, I wouldn't do it. Right. I mean, obviously, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I can remember times, you know, when I did, when I'd be in the studio. I mean, there's something great about having an engineer as well. I've done both. But, you know, sometimes it's just easier just to go in and just do something rather than sit there and then have to explain. I mean, if you think about it this way, I'm taking out I'm taking out a part of the process that could actually slow me down, which is like trying to tell someone, okay, drop me in on the third measure here, keep me in record until, you know, this part of the song, then take me out. Like, all that stuff, like, is eliminated. I just go in and I can just do what I do. And, and so for me, it's just a, it's an ease of operation. You know, I mean, I guess also you need to have the knowledge of how to do that. Otherwise, you can't do that, but... I mean, at the same, sometimes I've worked with engineers, and it was fun, too, because they, they really knew me and understood what I was trying to achieve. And, and also, you know, like with a band, that's the other thing. Like, I don't mind engineering myself, you know, if it's just me, you know, recording myself. But my worst nightmare is recording other people. Like, I, I just can't sit in the studio and press buttons. You know, it just it drives me berserk. So <laughs> in that instance, I would always have an engineer but, you know, when I'm alone and I come in and everything's turned on and all i got to do is press record, it's not so bad. Are there any songs from Sulting Earth that stand out to you more than the others? I certainly have favorites. You know, I mean, there's a song in there called This Is Life that I'm really pleased with the way it came out. I mean, I'm happy with the way everything came out. One thing about the record that I like a lot is that, you know, it really shows who I am as a recording artist. I mean, there's only 10 songs there, but it kind of shows the full pendulum swing so to speak you know i grew up listening to a lot of soul music and r&b music and obviously you can hear that influence in songs like this is life or my rock and at the same time you know i grew up listening to the hard rock bands that with you know blazing guitar players like van halen and, and that sort of thing so if you listen to a song like thunder or end of earth you can certainly hear that influence but all of it collectively together you know it, it's, it's a Richie Cotson sound, you know, this record. It really showcases what it is that I do as a recording artist. Your guitar playing covers rock, blues, jazz, and fusion to pop and soul. You have a remarkably diverse 20-year career as a guitarist, Richie, singer and songwriter. But how much growth musically have you seen yourself go through from album to album to album, man? Well, it's more personal growth for me than musical growth. And I think what happens is I'm fortunate that I have a very early age, been able to kind of find that bridge between what's happening with me emotionally as a person and then the delivery of the music. I think that's the thing that makes it work for me and, and why I have a career is that I have the ability to take whatever it is that's happening with me on an emotional level and convert that into something that's musical that people can, can feel as well. And so I don't know that I'm a better singer now than I was 10 years ago. I'm probably not. It's probably all about the same, but I'm a different person on a lot of levels. And so the music reflects that. So that's really where I think for, for someone like myself, where the evolution is coming from, I don't sit in a room and practice. I never actually do that, but I still create music. And so it's, it's the creative process for me that, that is inspiring, you know, turning having something come out of nothing, you know, that's kind of why I do it. What do you hope your fans take away from this album? Well, you know, I guess, uh, I don't know. <laughs> that's a tricky question. What do I hope they take away from it? I don't know. I, I just 
don't know how to answer that. I guess I, I wasn't thinking in terms of, of someone. You know, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to educate anyone. You know, I'm not hosting a seminar. You know, I basically am sharing some music. You know, that I wrote. So I don't think anywhere beyond the completed composition. So the song's done. It's on the record. That's about as far as my thought process goes. You know, I mean, ultimately, when people connect with a song or they come up to you and say, hey, you know, this particular song helped me through a bad time in my life or, you know, this particular song, we used it at our wedding. You know, sometimes I've had people come up to me that have tattoos that have my lyrics, you know. So those sort of things, that that hits me in a way like, wow, you know, whatever you're, you're doing in your studio is, is, is actually affecting people and, and that's pretty cool. You know, it, it is a, a communication thing between, you know, the, the artists and the audience, and especially live when you get on stage, you know, you want to make a connection with people through the music. And so when that happens, I guess that's a long-winded answer, uh, is to make a connection with the people that are listening to the record. That That is, is probably what I would like to see most happen. What can fans expect at a show from you, Richie, when they come out to see you uh, do your live stuff, man? Well, this show, you know, is going to be a lot of fun. In the past, we never had set lists on a lot of our old shows that we did. And I'm talking about Richie Cotson. I'm not talking about other bands that I've been in. With Richie Cotson, we've always been very free and loose and kind of read the room, read the crowd. And I would literally call tunes. You know, we kind of decide in the dressing room, okay, tonight we're going to open with whatever, and then we'll let the cards fall where they fall. And so this time, we actually are coming up with a... a more of a show. I'm doing a lot more material from the new record than I've ever done in the past. Usually in the past, if I had a new record, I'd do one or two songs from the new record. This time, I think we're doing something like seven. So that's kind of interesting. And then I'm also pulling out some songs from the past, a couple that I've never played, some that I have not played in a very long time. And then the other thing we're doing is, um, since there's so much happening on the new record around the piano, I'm doing a few songs where I'll be sitting behind the keyboard as well. And so I'm really excited about it. We had two rehearsals so far just to kind of figure out what works, what doesn't. We're going to go back in uh, next week and do some more rehearsing. And then by then we should probably have everything done and ready to go. And like I said, we're going to go out and start the tour April 21st. That's what I was going to say. I mean, you got 20 some albums. I mean, damn, it has to be hard to even, to even think of a set list with that many albums, you know, to choose from. <laughs> it's funny because sometimes I, I have songs that I've written that I forgot about. And it's kind of <laughs> funny because, you know, it, it's true. You know, people come up and say, Oh, you know, that song from such and such record. Why don't you play that? And I'm like, wow, that's <laughs> right. Why don't I play that? I forgot. I wrote that song. And it's true. It's funny. And because, you know, you have to think I've been making records since I was 18 and, and, yeah. and I've, I've evolved in such a, a, a different way. In other words, when I made my first record, I was a teenager shredding guitar player that just kind of played arpeggios really fast. And then somewhere in that transition from that first record to the second record, I decided that I really wanted to, you know, focus on writing songs and, and singing. And so then from there, I kind of evolved, obviously, into whatever it is, whatever monster I've become now. <laughs> but um, it's an interesting thing to look back. You know, actually, my wife had her phone up today, and she was looking on Instagram, and someone posted some instructional video I did when I was 18, and I, I couldn't even hear it. I was like, oh, my God, stop. I said, it sounds like, I feel like I'm listening to a video game. It sounds like a video game. But, you know, that's what I was doing when I was 17, 18 years old. That's what I was doing back then. So yeah. it's interesting to see, to go back sometimes and see the evolution. And sometimes I cringe, and then other times I'm like, wow, that was <laughs> badass. How the hell did I do that? You know? <laughs> well, sure. Sure. I've, I've even done that with my interviews, like going back to when I first started to now. I'm like, oh, my God, I sound horrible. <laughs> did yeah. you enjoy playing with Poison after C.C. DeVille left the band? You know, I did. I really, really did. And it was kind of something that I never was able to predict that I would have had the opportunity to do. And one of the things I always say about that experience is the record that we made. I really, despite anything, really love the music we made. I think we did a very cool record. And, you know, I feel very close to that album because, you know, we wrote everything together and 
there were some songs that I had actually written prior to being in Poison that I brought in, and, and we turned those into Poison songs as well. So the experience was good. It's a long time ago. I mean, we're talking about, you know, I was in, I joined that band in 1991, and by the end of 93, I was out. So you have to look at it from my perspective. You know, it was a long, long time ago and a very, very tiny period of time in my life. So it was something that I, that, when I look back when I'm happy I did it, and it was a great experience. But, you know, it's not something I really think about very often unless somebody you know, asks me about it. And I have no problems, you know, talking about it. But it's a very, very small part of my life when I really look at, you know, the fact that I'm 47 and so many other things have happened, you know. Yeah, Stand Off That Album is an amazing song. It still gives me chills to, to even think about it. But, you know, could, could Native Tongue easily been your solo album, possibly, man, if you think about it, honestly? Well, you know, I think I might have jokingly said that to somebody at one time, and somehow that made it in the press. But the reality is, is that they did certainly give me a lot of um, a lot of room. We'll put it that way. And you know, they kind of looked to me. I mean, to, to kind of carve out a, a sound that was unlike anything they had done before. So you know, I certainly had a big influence on the record, but that does not undermine in any way you know, what what they inputted either. I mean, obviously. A collaboration. What's your take on this digital era that we're in as far as recording and the way that music is distributed? Well, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that people have all kinds of opinions about that, you know. I have to say, in the end, for me, I'm happy things are the way they were because if they weren't, I probably would not have a career. Now, a lot of other people like to complain and, and this and that, and that's fine because everybody is in a different situation. But what I do know for a fact is in the 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, I had a hard time. The only way for me to get my music out would be to be stuck with a record label and having to hope they sign me and and listen to their ideas on what I should be doing creatively because they're investing money and, and it's just so ugly and, and sticky and ugh, just makes me cringe thinking about it. And so what happened for, for me is that because, you know, I already had a name and people that were interested in me, once the business came to the point where I could take my music and go direct to my fan base, suddenly I started to have a career again. Suddenly I had people downloading my music, listening to my music. I had all kinds of requests to tour in places like Europe, places like Brazil, Argentina, Mexico. And so I started touring and building my base. You know, I spent months at a time in Europe in a van with my, my guys, you know, driving around and playing everywhere. We played in, in, in little towns in Italy in the courtyard of a castle. We played in clubs, nice clubs, ugly clubs, all kinds of stuff everywhere. And in those years, I was really kind of rebuilding my base. And so, and because of the internet, because I could put the music out there and service it myself, direct my fan base, suddenly my career started to come back together again. And so for me, had technology not become what it is, I, I would certainly not have the career that I have. So I, I like it. I know a lot of people don't, you know, and, but everybody's situation is different. I think it's a pretty cool thing that's out there right now. You know, it's easier to get stuff out quicker, like EPs and things like that for fans that, that don't want to wait on things. But like you said, to me, it's a double-edged sword with the uh, with the digital era type deal. Yeah, I guess for some people it is. I I, I feel like it's worked for me. I, I know you're not inventing the wheel of, of of guitar playing Richie or anything like that. But what what does Richie Coxon, as a guitar player, bring to the table for music, man? That's not out there. It's real hard for me to talk about myself and what makes me unique because suddenly I start to feel like I'm, I don't know, I don't want to say, I, it feels obnoxious. It feels obnoxious for me to sit and say, well, you know, the difference between me and, and this other guy is, well, you know, I can sing. <laughs> it just seems ridiculous, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. You know, it's like when you make music, you, you do a show, people like you or they don't. I mean, that's really how I feel about it. Now, when I was younger, you know, I probably felt like I had more to prove because nobody knew anything about me. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, there's a massive catalog of music that I've done. At this point, you know, there's no real question of what it is that I do, what I excel at, what I don't excel at. I mean, it's like, you know, go to iTunes and download a record and you'll hear it for yourself or 
go to Spotify and, and so, you know, make a playlist. You can, you can hear it. But I think that to actually talk about what makes me unique or not so unique or any of that, it doesn't feel, it feels weird. It doesn't feel so good. You know, it feels like listening to, you know, your nails on a chalkboard or something, you know? <laughs> right. What first made you want to become a musician? Well, that's a, an easy question to answer. I was very young, and I was one of those kids that was always trying to put on a show for the family when they'd come over for little events and that sort of thing. And so I can remember dancing around and finally someone saying, hey, you know, he seems to really, um, really love music. You should maybe get him piano lessons because we had a piano sitting in the house. And so I, I took lessons for a little while. I didn't really like the lesson part of it. I wasn't too... Uh, you know, in love with my teacher and just seemed kind of boring for me as a little kid. But then about a year later, I saw a guitar, an electric guitar at a yard sale, and I realized that's what I wanted to do. And then I started taking lessons, and my teacher was really cool, and, you know, kind of like a long-haired biker-looking dude. And so it all just kind of clicked. And I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to be a guitar player. So uh, it, it kind of just fell together at that point. Is there any show or a moment that stands out to you more than any that you can recall being a part of, whether it be your solo shows, Poison, or the Winery Dogs, that made you think, you know, made you think like, geez, this is, this is pretty damn awesome. You know, I really can't believe I'm actually doing this. Oh, yeah. In 2006, I was the opening act for the Rolling Stones on their entire Japanese tour. And I think, I don't remember how many shows we did, but maybe it was five, maybe it was six. I don't know. It could have been seven, but there were several shows. And we played all the stadiums there, the indoor stadiums. So the, the Osaka Dome, Tokyo Dome, the Sapporo Dome. And uh, I guess there was five shows. There must have been five. But it was really cool. And it was one of those things where I didn't believe it was going to happen until after I did the first show. So I really didn't tell many people that I was going to Japan to open for the Stones until I got home. And then I showed pictures and I said, look what I did. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty cool. You know, that was, that was, that was very cool. Little moments like that. You know, we played on, um, we played on Arsenio Hall show and we played on the tonight show. And I remember when I did that, I was really young, like 21. And I thought that was really cool to be on a TV show that I had always watched. And they like, I would watch Arsenio Hall every night when I was young, you know, and, to end up meeting him and playing on his show was pretty cool. So little things like that kind of stick in your mind. It's a shame those shows ain't around no more. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, what do they have now? Jimmy Fallon. I like him. He's, he's very talented, actually. It's yeah. mind blowing what he can do, you know? And then they got Conan and then they've got the late, late show and Colbert, I think. And yeah. On Jimmy. Well, and Arsenio and Arsenio he a, actually does have a, music guests. Arsenio like, kind of made a comeback for a minute, and actually the Winery Dogs went and, and filmed a show and did a pilot, and then suddenly we were going to be on the show, and then I don't know what happened. He, he went away again, and he doesn't have a show. But um, oh. I almost did it twice. <laughs> <laughs> what was you saying? 20, in a 20-year span. Yeah. On Jimmy Kimmel's show, he oh, actually geez. has musical guests still, like, every now and then I'll catch a decent performance on there. Like, he had Deftones last year. So it was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's another guy that does that car karaoke thing that I've seen, which is really cool when he drives around with the singers and yeah. I mean, I've seen him do it with Adele and I can't remember his name. He's a huge star, but that thing is really cool. Yeah. He said the chili peppers on there. He said Metallica, Lady Gaga. Yeah. He's, I, I know what you're talking about, Rich. I, it, it's pretty hilarious in what he does, but it's pretty damn good actually. Yeah. It's cool. <clears throat> I just like to say, as a fan of your music, man, thank you for what you do. I I love your guitar playing, and it's pretty damn awesome, dude. Right on. Yeah, I hope to meet you guys at some point out there on the tour. Sure. Hey, before I let you go, would you care to do a promo for the show, if that's okay? Yeah. Hi, this is Richie Cotson, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Everybody stick around. We've got some great music coming up, and you only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour and Uber City Radio from my lovely co-host. Crystal. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richie. Thanks. I'll talk to you later.